Sark, and he wants to just say hello. Hello. No, I'm just kidding. Um, now, welcome to everybody. You know, I think this is a, obviously a great opportunity uh, for the University of Texas to be joining the Southeastern Conference, and I think a great opportunity for the SEC media to be in Dallas with us and uh, to be part of this and, and kind of going through media day. So pretty cool. Right here on the front row to start. Coach Eric Bailey with the Tulsa World. Uh, looking back, I don't mean to go back too much back last year, but the drive against Oklahoma in the final minutes of the game, how much do you recall of that drive and how much can that be a teaching tool for your defense and how much did that really help you in the second half of the season? Yeah, I, I remember it. So, <laughs> um, you know, I think I think one of the things that happens in critical moments is you have to have the ability to execute. And I felt like when you analyze that drive, our execution was not very good. And that's to take nothing away from 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 OU and and Dylan Gabriel had a, and Stoops and that that whole crew. They, that was a heck of a drive. But we didn't execute very well, and when you when you blow three coverages in one drive, and ultimately on you blow a coverage on a, on a touchdown that, that gets you beat, it goes back to execution. And I and I do think that that helped when you can walk a team through the drive and okay, where what was our part in that drive, and then how are we going to get better at it moving forward? And um, I think it helped. Um, definitely, we still have room for improvement. That's for sure. On the aisle, second row. Coach, Evan Kamiko, Pig Trail Nation. You touched on it in the end of your opening statement in the other room, how you're able to now uh, renew some of these old Southwest Conference rivalries with yeah. Arkansas and Texas A&M. You got a taste of it in 2021 playing against Arkansas, but what makes you excited for the future of that rivalry and being able to etch your name next to guys like Daryl Royal and Frank Broyles? First of all, I'd like to play better than we played in 2021. We did not play very good uh, in that ball game, and it's a great environment. Now, I, I always I jokingly say this, and – um, I feel like when you go to Arkansas um, that I think I almost at times feel like they hate Texas more than they like themselves. I mean, that, so they're, they're, it, that's a real rivalry. You know, that's when you know you're in a real rivalry. And I know so much has been made of us getting to play A&M again. Um, but the fact that we get to play Arkansas again is, is awesome. I mean, how many teams in the country get to play three rivalry games in the regular season? And uh, we get to do that. And so um, that's, that's one of the beauties of being here. It's one of the beauties of being in the Southeastern Conference. And, and part of that is, you know, so much has been made of conference realignment and so much has been made of teams now traveling across the country and losing rivalry games that they've, that they've had historically we've benefited you know we we got two back and so we're, we're looking forward to it and that's like i said it's uh, one of the, one of the beauties of, of making this move front row left side hey steve colin wilson with the action network as a two-time arkansas graduate you're exactly correct um <laughs> my question in 2021 texas was <laughs> texas was fourth in the nation in red zone td percentage last year that fell to 120th is that the loss of 20 all-purpose TDs from Bajon Robinson? Is it luck? Or like you mentioned, you have 25 leaders that are still marinating. Yeah, no, I, I, I think there's probably a byproduct of a few things. Um, you know, we lost Bijan Robinson. You know, anytime you lose a top 10 draft pick at running back, that's going to affect some of your play. We lost Roshan Johnson, too, uh, who, who's a great player. And those two guys and the wildcat aspect and some of the things that we like to do with him there. And then last year comes around and – Every year is different, and we missed some opportunities that I thought we could have taken advantage of that could dramatically change that number. Um, the play caller, me, uh, probably maybe at times tried too hard and different things, and so you just get back to the drawing board. And like every year, you have things in areas that things you want to work on, you want to place an emphasis on, and um, we've, uh, we've definitely done that. And I think we've got enough versatility in our offense to be a lot more effective in the red area because we're going to need to be. It, it, we work way too hard to get ourselves all the way down there and be so efficient between the 20s not to put the ball in the end zone. On the end, fourth row, and then pass it to the aisle. Uh, Jeff Howe, Horns 24-7. Sark, I hate to go back to the red zone, but the OU game last year when they had the, the goal line stand, what, what did that do for, for Coach Flood's group, just the offensive line as a whole in terms of how they spun that forward? And then – with that unit's growth this year, how much of that is tied into to Kelvin continuing to, to grow and reach his ceiling? Yeah, I mean, I, I think any time you don't score on the goal line, you know, the, the two people get, get criticized, or two groups. One is the offensive line, two is the play caller, right? 
And, um, you know, we, we take pride in our work. Our offensive line takes a lot of pride in their work. And Coach Flood does a great job. Um, I thought we were a lot more effective in those situations as the season went on and later in the year, and it showed. We got a little bit more creative um, and finding ways to, you know, whether it was Murphy or Sweat and different different people touching the ball. Um, and so that – but that – then goes into who are we now? And to your point, you know, Kelvin's maturation, uh, he's no longer the young lineman, the freshman, sophomore, left tackle. He's going into his third year. Uh, he exemplifies everything you'd want a Longhorn to be. And But that's that group pretty much in general. You think about Hayden Connor and his experience. Think about Jake Majors and his experience at center. Think about DJ Campbell and Cole Hudson, who have both started multiple games at right guard. Um, and so to go along with all this young talent that's coming up, and I think we've been really fortunate to have some consistency on the offensive line, which hasn't forced us to play young players too soon. So we've been allowed to develop a lot of young players that now – if we can get into some of the rotational stuff that we want to get into early in the season to get guys some experience um, because we're going to need more bodies than just five or six, right? We're going to be, we need to be prepared to play eight, nine, or 10 this fall. But I do think we have the talent to do it. We just got to make sure that we get them some experience. Left side, second row. Spencer McLaughlin, Locked On Podcast Network. You said in the other room, Coach, that you feel like this is the deepest and most talented team you've had, and now your fourth year at Texas. You lost several early-round NFL draft picks at a variety of positions. I was wondering if you could expand upon how you feel like your team has reloaded to be even better without guys like Byron Murphy and Adonai Mitchell. Yeah, I, I think it varies no, no. by position group, right? And, and some of these guys that – Maybe you don't know all their names. Like, I'm going to give you a name, Anthony Hill Jr., who I think is the most underrated linebacker in the country. But he's a true sophomore. Maybe not everybody knows his name. I think that guy's poised for, for a great season. Um, you know, Cedric Baxter, a guy who was a starter as a true freshman for us the first two games of the year, hurts his foot, and he gets Wally pipped by Jonathan Brooks, who ends up being the first running back taken in the NFL draft. Well, Cedric Baxter is going to be a sophomore for us this year. Um, anytime you have a veteran quarterback, a third-year starting quarterback, what a luxury that is. Anytime you're returning five starting offensive linemen, what a luxury that is. But then I think about some of the additions we've made. I think about the addition of a Trey Moore and what his ability to, to, to rush the passer. I think about the addition of an Andrew Makuba at safety. Uh, I think about the addition of the three wideouts that, that we got out of the portal in uh, Isaiah Bond, Matthew Golden, and Silas Bolden, not to mention an Amari Nyblack at tight end. So there's this nice influx on our roster of returning players who have grown up in our system, transfers that have come in to fill some voids that need to be filled, but also a really talented freshman class, whether you want to talk about a Colin Simmons or a Ryan Wingo, um, to, just to name a, a couple of those guys. Like this, this is a very talented team, but we're not one-dimensionally talented. It's talented and deep across the board at multiple positions with a wide range. We're not young. We're not old. We're just kind of, kind of in our sweet spot of where we need to be. On the aisle, on the right. Hey, Coach. Uh, Steve Moulton, WZZN out of Huntsville, Alabama. Welcome back to the SEC. Thank you. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask, uh, the conversation that you had with Joel Clyde, you talked about the maturation of being a coach and finding your sweet spot. How are you different today as a head coach than, say, at Washington in your previous stops? Yeah, I think I have a much better appreciation for um, consistency, okay? And part of that I think I got – a fair amount from Coach Saban, but I didn't know that I would value it as much as I did, right? Sometimes people think of consistency as mundane, and I don't think of it as mundane. I think of structure. I think of organized. I think of disciplined, and that suited me well, but in the midst of all that, I also have learned I value personal connection, and my connection with our players, my connection with our staff matters to me. And so the combination of those two things, um, I think, have been probably the biggest shift of, of kind of who I am as a coach today. Um, you know, just being authentic, being transparent, being true to our players, being honest. Um, 
I think has, has been beneficial as well. But again, you just find out about who you are and what's important to you, what makes you tick. You tap into it, and then that removes some of the unknown and uncertainty for the players. They know what to expect day in and day out. And then if you can create an environment for the players where they want to be in your building, they want to go to work, that's when you really have something. And I think we've created that environment. We, everybody in our building can't wait to get in there and do whatever their task is for the day. And um, when you can do that and there's a level of consistency from the top, man, it makes things go really smoothly. And that, that's kind of our sweet spot right now. Three final questions. We'll go on the third row and then come to the front. Uh, Michael Cobble out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I'm just curious, what do you see as the, the real challenge to joining this conference? You guys are elite programs, but you're stepping into something new. Is it the week-to-week -week grind like most of us have projected, or is it stuff that we'll never see on Saturdays, like program building? Well, I, I would, for us, as it pertains just to the, the SEC, I would probably say it's the week-to-week and, and I, don't, I don't know if grind is the right word. It's, it's the having the, um, the mental fortitude to refocus again because there aren't any off weeks. You, you're going against the elite coaches in America. You're going against the elite players in America. More players drafted out of the SEC to the NFL draft year after year after year after year after year. You're, you, so how do, you, how do you put forth the same level of preparation, the same practice habits, not, not thinking I'm good now. You always have to strive to improve and try to get better. Um, that's, that's the task, right? And that's kind of falls solely on me to make sure that I'm motivating our team to be in the right mental space for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. The physical part is the physical part. And we're going to knock on wood, but we're probably going to have some injuries. We're going to have to play more players. All that stuff is fine. We're built for that. Like, we've built a team that is ready to go do that. It's having the mental fortitude week in and week out to make sure that we're focused on the task at hand and then putting forth the right preparation to get ourselves prepared to play on Saturdays. Front row. <clears throat> Hey, Steve, good to see you. you Brett too. McMurphy with the Action Network. Uh, you've talked here, you've talked before about what Nick's meant to you in your career and your life. I talked to Lane a little bit about it. Because of what he did for you, are you more likely to kind of give coaches a second chance that maybe have had some problems in the past or just try to help them out the same way that Nick helped out you in your career? For sure, for sure. You know, I, I think that um, – you know, there was a unique model that, that Coach Saban had at Alabama. Um, you know, how do you, how do you bring in a Steve Sarkeesian, a Lane Kiffin, uh, a Mike Loxley, you know, uh, 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 Mark, uh, Mike Stoops, uh, Charlie Strong, I mean, a bunch of guys, you know. I mean, there's a major Applewhite. All these guys that, hey, all of us, none of us are perfect, right? None of us in this room are perfect, right? And, and the fact that he was willing to extend that olive branch to all of us, in a way, sometimes now it gives me the opportunity to pay it forward. And um, I look for those opportunities when I can um, to try to give people that opportunity to kickstart their own career. Um, but I'm forever grateful. Like, I will, I will forever be grateful to him for what he was able to do for myself, my family. Um, and, and I think that's one of the biggest misnomers about Nick, Nick Saban and Miss Terry, for that matter. They're probably two of the most compassionate people that I've ever met. And everybody wants to see him throwing the straw hat at practice. Everybody wants to see the headset fly. Everybody wants to see the rant at the press conference and, and label him that that's who he is. But in reality, he's probably one of the most compassionate people that I've ever been around and one of the more forgiving people that I've ever been around. And so that's what I kind of hold on to about him. One quick question right here. We're done. AP Stedham of AP and Kelly, as we see at Syndicated Radio. Uh, Coach, you've been through the transfer portal. What are some of the criteria you feel that makes you successful when you bring in a player and sometimes they know they don't produce, so you probably learn along the way. What are some of the criteria that you, you think you need to follow? Yeah, you know, I, I think, first of all, you have to say, we, when we go into the portal, we, we're, there's some people like us or some not, but we go to the portal to fulfill a specific need. In some years, you have more needs than others. And once you try to identify, okay, we have a need at a specific position, then you try to identify players that fit the profile of what we look for in that position. Once you can identify the list of the players that fit the profile, then you got to try to dig into 
do they fit the personality of who we are as a team? And it's like speed dating, okay? High school recruiting, I recruit these kids for two, three years, right? And then they decide and then you get them. Well, in the portal, you might have two or three days to decide if I'm going to bring him on a visit and then he might commit. And so how do you try to identify players that fit culturally what we're about? A lot of what we do is try to fall back into players that we've recruited previously because that helps. We have a little bit of information on them. But, hey, there's, there's no science to portal recruiting right now. It, it's, it's speed dating. Sometimes it feels like the first one to the door wins. Um, Sometimes it's the ones that offer the most money wins. You, you just don't know. And so you, you just try to navigate that and you try to take this big pool of players that all go in the portal and shrink it down as best you can to identify who we think best fits the University of Texas.